Three principles are most common when drafting equality legislation. Like people should be treated alike. To treat people equally, sometimes they must be treated differently. And equality is achieved by enhancing opportunities. In today's lesson, we'll spend most of our time on principle one, as this one tends to dominate both popular perception and tends to be the basis of much of current lawmaking efforts. Principle one is primarily about treatment. This is the most basic form of equality. Equality through consistency. In practical terms, basic equality translates into a simple constraint on all rule and policy making. This constraint means exclusionary laws must be avoided and prejudicial behavior must be prohibited. This seems reasonable, perhaps even sensible, and aligns well with many conceptions of justice. But even a cursory examination of the phrase leaves us wanting for two reasons. When is a person like someone else? What criteria or threshold do we use to evaluate their likeness? Are two women necessarily alike? Biologically, yes. They're both humans of the female sex. But what about socially? Is Theresa May like the women who clean her toilets? What about a woman and a man? Biologically, no. They may both be human, but the difference in sex are self-evident. In a patriarchal society, differences in sex ultimately manifest as differences in gender. Equality as consistency requires us to determine a template, like or equal to whom. In a patriarchal society, the equality norm often plays out in invidious ways, such as when a female forest firefighter was dismissed for failing to pass an aerobic test based on male physiology. The Canadian Court of Appeals held that a different standard would amount to reverse discrimination against men. The decision was eventually reversed by the Supreme Court. To quote Catherine McKinnon, Concealed is the substantive way in which man has become the measure of all things. Under the sameness standard, women are measured according to our correspondence with man. Gender neutrality is thus simply the male standard. Her point is that within equality as consistency, there is need for a comparator so as to identify inconsistency in treatment, meaning evidence of a similarly situated person of a different sex or different ethnicity or other characteristic receiving more favorable treatment. To compare them, we must disregard their personal characteristics. But an individual's social, economic, and political capacities are determined precisely by these characteristics. According to McKinnon and others, the comparator in the equality as consistency principle is typically white, male, Christian, able-bodied, and heterosexual. This leads us to the second flaw in the like others approach. Equality as consistency is a relative concept. By this, I mean that the only requirement is to treat like people in similar fashion. But what if we treat both of them poorly? Take, for instance, a U.S. case in which an American city was required to desegregate its whites-only swimming pools. City officials opted to close all pools instead. Something quite similar happened in Ontario when Muslims petitioned the province for access to religious-based family arbitration, similar to what Jews and Catholics enjoyed up until that point, only to have the province scrap the program for all faiths. Both of these measures fulfilled the equality as consistency principle without benefiting anyone. A law that appears equal on its face can in practice produce substantial levels of discrimination and inequality. To summarize, the principle, like people should be treated alike, has both strengths and flaws. The main strength is that exclusionary laws and discrimination are both prohibited. The main flaw is that the principle is too abstract as it ignores existing distributions of power and wealth. The second principle, to treat people equally, sometimes they must be treated differently, is primarily about outcomes. The implication of the principle is that equality of results, or equality in outcomes, may require unequal treatment. It may require this unequal treatment as identical treatment can often reinforce discrimination based upon past or ongoing instances of discrimination. So if we were to take, for example, 
literacy, literacy, <laughs> literacy、uh, tests as a precondition to voting. Even if applied equally to all, a literacy test will often result in the exclusion or disenfranchisement of significant portions of minority and poor communities due to past instances of exclusion from education or current instances of the provision of inferior levels of education. In contrast with the first principle, the second principle focuses on context as it seeks to correct mal. Distribution. The main flaw, however, is that within this second principle, the objectives appear contradictory. First, the principle is often applied primarily to an individual to address a specific instance of discrimination, but rarely anything more. For example, allowing a Sikh man to wear his turban while working for the RCMP. Did not lead to proportionate representation of Sikh in Canadian police forces. The principle focuses primarily on individual instances of discrimination. However, exemplifying the contradictory nature of the principle, the flip side of the first flaw is that sometimes the aim is to ensure proportionate representation. In these instances, there is no need for any discrimination. Underrepresentation is sufficient to warrant. Intervention. This is somewhat controversial, as it's not just about removing discriminatory barriers, but positively pursuing equal representation through preferential treatment. A range of methods is used, including encouragement, training, and, most controversially, quotas. Whether or not this amounts to equality is debatable. Some prefer to describe it as proportionality, or fairness, or even balance. A third objective of this principle is to diagnose discrimination in the form of barriers to entry. The presumption is that in a non-discriminatory environment, we should expect an equal spread of members from varying backgrounds in the same proportions as they are spread across society. If a group happens to be underrepresented, the assumption is that some form of discrimination is taking place. If no discriminatory criterion. Can be identified. Then the assumption is that maldistribution is the product of personal preference. For example, there is almost a complete absence of female pilots, since we cannot identify exclusion of women based on anything other than a low number of adequately trained female pilots. There is no discrimination. To summarize, the main strength. Of the second principle is that it focuses on context, thereby helping to correct maldistribution. The main flaw, however, is that the objectives often appear contradictory, resulting in a significant amount of ineffectiveness. The third principle focuses on opportunities. The third principle places emphasis on opportunities. This is considered an alternative to formal or basic equality and equality of results. First, since equal treatment, when applied to a background of past or current structural discrimination, is likely to deepen disadvantage, different starting points necessarily make a situation unfair. And second, equality of results will subordinate self-determination in favor of social engineering, also considered unfair. Proponents of equality of opportunity argue that self-fulfillment. Should be at the basis of legal interventions in the promotion of equality. What they argue is that self-fulfillment is enhanced when people are provided opportunity to pursue what they desire. In other words, we level the starting point and allow people to pursue the objectives they see fit, and let the chips fall where they may. The strength then is that this principle promotes human autonomy. There are, of course, a number of important flaws. What type of measure is required to ensure that people can compete equally? Procedural measures would involve the removal of obstacles to the advancement of disadvantaged groups. For example, when recruiting for law firms, the old boys club would need to be replaced with something a little more transparent. Unfortunately, 
even a procedural adjustment does not guarantee that people from disadvantaged groups will be selected. One simply needs to look at the partners in virtually every major Canadian law firm. Again, the legacy of past discrimination runs deep. For example, applications to law schools from people of indigenous backgrounds remains disproportionately low. Even if the procedures are made equitable, substantively, the effects of past discrimination are still in place. Substantive measures, of course, are necessarily more intrusive in that they require positive efforts to do away with the relics of past discrimination or the consequences of present discrimination. For example, partnership track for law firms is usually a set number of years. Those who put in the time can ultimately apply for the promotion. This suggests that merit is at the heart of the system, as each new associate enjoys the opportunity to become partner. But what happens if a female associate elects to have children, requiring time off for pregnancy, lactation, and child rearing? Does she still enjoy equality of opportunity, or must she forego motherhood to make partner? Must a man also forego fatherhood? In short, Principle 3 has an important strength. It promotes human autonomy. However, it is also afflicted with an important weakness. It can survive alongside both inequality of treatment and inequality of outcome. The three principles each have their strengths and weaknesses. Each of these principles promotes a different conception of equality and thus triggers different preferred values. Do we prefer redistributive equality? To alleviate disadvantage or liberal equality to treat people with equal concern perhaps neoliberal equality to provide equal access to the market or political equality to facilitate equal involvement in decision making in the next lesson we will consider some of the values the pursuit of equality seeks to promote